live from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Shanali Basak. And I'm Tim Stunnebeck. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. We'll look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping the world of decentralized finance. The Bitcoin halving is now about 10 days away, and we're going to talk to one of the largest miners in the space, the CEO of Marathon Digital. Plus, in D.C. right now, a Senate hearing is underway with Deputy U.S. Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyamo discussing efforts to counter illicit finance. We're going to talk to Circle's head of global policy, who pushes back against how the industry is depicted on the issue. And we're going to get the latest on the whereabouts of Terraform co-founder Do Kwan, as he is found liable for fraud in a U.S. government lawsuit over the firm's 2022 collapse. All that and more are coming up over the next half hour. But first, here's a snapshot of the market today. We're seeing crypto lower across the board as we see a risk-off day in general ahead of key inflation data tomorrow. That said, a relatively steady march higher for Bitcoin over the last week, though we are shy of $70,000. Over the last seven days, higher by 5.4%. Bitcoin did reach a high of 72500 yesterday. Remember, the all-time high set last month, 73700 and 97. And here's that sea of red. Ether also moving a leg lower today, down 4.3%. Remember, Ether still not back to its 2021 highs of $4,800. Crypto-related stocks also moving lower today after surging yesterday on a Bitcoin rally. Coinbase now down 4.4%. MicroStrategy also rallying yesterday, uh, down today by 7.3%. Remember, both of these stocks up double digits year to date. Uh, we should note that MicroStrategy up more than 100% so far this year after last year's 350% increase, Shanali. And Tim, I also want to take a look at that dynamic you were talking about of Bitcoin relative to Ether because it is sending a signal. According to crypto trading firm QCP, it is hinting at a possible slowdown in risk appetite for crypto. And the pattern could be a very early signal, they say, of FOMO morphing into fear if Ether is viewed as a proxy for sentiment towards smaller tokens. Now, what we're looking at here is that ratio really being at the highest level since back in 2021 before Bitcoin much more valuable than Ether. Finally, the to converging into 2021 a little bit more and back still now Bitcoin being more valuable and Ether being a little more stagnant. But remember, Ether is still one of the largest crypto assets out there, Tim. And it is difficult to say about what it means for the sentiment for the rest of the smaller crypto tokens out there. OK, well, speaking of Bitcoin, uh, I do want to take a look at now things look ahead of the halving. Here's another chart. Uh, this is the daily revenue for crypto miners relative to the price of Bitcoin. This chart courtesy of Deutsche Bank. Now on the left axis, what you see here is the daily Bitcoin miner revenue. Then over there on the right axis, you see the price of Bitcoin. Perhaps unsurprisingly, miners make more money when the Bitcoin price is higher. Hit a record level this year. Now that the halving is coming up this month, though, it's going to cost more to mine an individual Bitcoin. So unless prices go up, and miners are able to actually mine for less, profit margins are at risk. Bloomberg Originals explored how the halving will work. But on the horizon is a preordained event that will change the business of Bitcoin forever. It's called the halving. It will become much more difficult for miners to produce new coins. After the halving, margins will be cut overnight by 50%. So the halving might be good for the holders, but it's not necessarily good for the miners. Some companies are either bulking up for scale or finding ways to diversify. Some companies that in the past were Bitcoin mining, they've shifted over to training these ever bigger AI models. This is kind of a moment for Bitcoin that is arguably one of its biggest ever. 21 million. That is the total number of Bitcoins that can ever exist. And over 19 million of those have already been awarded. The halving is the mechanism designed to create scarcity and control Bitcoin's limited supply. It happens every four years, and when it does, all future block rewards are cut in half. The halving is a natural phenomenon in Bitcoin that disciplines the entire market and forces it to become more efficient. Let's now bring in Marathon Digital's Fred Thiel, the CEO of the largest mining company by market cap, and he comes to us from Washington. And it's worthwhile to start with the prices here of Bitcoin and how you think it might be impact into the halving. A lot of questions out there of whether a lot of those rises have already been baked in. Well, I think the ETF's approval, um, which has been a huge success, has attracted capital into the market and essentially brought forward what could have been the price appreciation we typically would have seen 
three to six months post having. So I think we're seeing part of that now uh, already. Uh, these ETFs, 11 were approved. Four of the 11 ETFs are the most successful ETF launches on record uh, ever. And the total amount of capital in the ETFs uh, already has surpassed 50% of the amount of uh, assets under management in gold ETFs. So uh, what has happened in three or four months compared to 20 years with gold is pretty astounding. And so we think that has pulled forward some of the demand. Uh, the halving event will reduce the supply of Bitcoin by about 450 a day, the new emissions of Bitcoin, uh, which will have some small impact on price most probably. But as miners, we're very excited to go into a halving where for once price has not declined prior to the halving, but rather price has gone up. So everybody's obviously maximizing and optimizing to that. Right, Fred, I want to talk about exactly what you're doing to optimize ahead of that halving. Uh, over at Marathon, you guys, uh, on average, mine about 28.7 Bitcoin each day. Um, what are you doing to decrease the cost since it's going to cost you more to mine these Bitcoin? What are you doing to save money and uh, ease your margins? Great question. So we built the business and scaled very quickly using an asset light model, where we essentially relied on third parties to build the infrastructure, the hosting, the data centers, if you would. Then we would come in, plug in our miners. So 100% of our CapEx was invested in miners that allowed us to scale to become the largest miner, publicly traded miner, arguably, in the world. Then in December, we went and started looking at those hosting relationships, and we started moving to consolidate them. And we now have gone from owning less than 3% of our facilities to owning over 53% of our facilities in just a, sh a few short months. The benefit there is it allows us to essentially take out the middleman, take out the margin that we were paying a third party to build infrastructure and manage it. And we were able to do that at a cost less than the replacement cost for those assets. So. Uh, a net net great gain for our shareholders in that regard. We'll continue to do that as we move forward, as well as continue to expand through owned and operated facilities, both in the U.S. and abroad. Average daily Bitcoin produced, you have at 28.7 as of the end of February. When you think about the halving, how is it going to change your economics and what you see in terms of Bitcoin rewards, you think? So the essentially, if you look at the number 28 um, on average per day, that would turn to be 14 roughly uh, per day. We'll have to see the impact, if any, on the global hash rate. Remembering that Bitcoin mining is a zero sum game. Uh, today, there are 900 Bitcoin made a day or emitted a day. Uh, post having, it'll be 450. And all the people mining are vying for that. So all our compute is competing for that. So the key is to be one of the most energy efficient miners. Marathon's fleet is amongst the most energy efficient uh, in the industry. Those miners that have less efficient machines uh, may have to shut off. But the high price of Bitcoin right now essentially has made it profitable for even marginal miners mm. to mine post having. Uh, what we'll have to see is really what happens to the dynamic. If the price of Bitcoin were to drop ten, twenty thousand uh, dollars per Bitcoin, that could potentially push some of the more marginal miners over the edge and they would have to stop mining and they could become acquisition targets potentially. You also have a fairly large number of rigs, the computers, if you would, that miners use that are not very energy efficient that will be marginalized by this having. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens, but we're very focused on both organic and inorganic growth. And we believe that the industry globally is going to continue to grow and add hash rate uh, to continue to mine and secure the Bitcoin blockchain. Fred, on average, how much does it cost you to, to mine a Bitcoin? And uh, like, what's the cost of extraction? Uh, and then I I'm wondering also about potentially moving more outside of the U.S., uh, perhaps to find uh, cheaper energy. Sure. So uh, our average cost to mine Bitcoin across all the facilities is in the low $20,000 range today. And, and by that, we include the energy cost as well as the operating overhead. Uh, meaning the people on the ground that run the facilities, any cost to run the facilities, et cetera. Uh, so it's the marginal cost to mine Bitcoin, if you would. Um, that will now go to about $46,000 on average. Uh, obviously, the people cost doesn't increase. It's just the amount of effort, the amount of energy that the miners have to um, do that will double. Um, so domestically, we're still going to be in a great position. We operate today on three continents, North America, um, the Gulf region in Africa, as well as Latin America and Paraguay. 
We're going to continue to grow our business internationally. One of our goals is to have 50% of our revenues from outside of the U.S. by 2028, which is the next halving in line after the one we're going to have here in a couple of weeks. The other thing we're doing, we're very focused on a vertically integrated technology stack. So everything from our pool software, which is the orchestration layer that kind of controls what our miners do, all the way down to the firmware in the miners and also investments in ASIC technology through a company called Oridine, which is the only U.S. ASIC manufacturer in the space um, located in Silicon Valley. And then also immersion or cooling technology. We just released some uh, very interesting immersion technology at the Empower conference in Houston a few weeks ago. And so we think that even the AI industry will have interest in that. So diversifying revenue streams, optimizing existing operations, Fred, and continue to expand. Fred, quickly here, how do you feel about the future when it comes to your industry? You kind of alluded to this idea that players could be washed out when we think about the dynamics and the pressure that it puts on uh, the Bitcoin having rewards being less uh, this cycle and, of course, in future cycles. How are you preparing for that potential washout? You mentioned acquisitions. What do you do today to prepare for that opportunity? And how big do you think the opportunity so will be? Yeah, it, great question. So we are believers that Bitcoin miners have to try to strive to get to zero cost energy. And what do I mean by that? It means that basically the only way we'll survive long term is that our cost of energy is offset by something else. So we have started an initiative that we call energy harvesting. This is where we are going to landfills and using stranded methane gas from landfills. It could be oil fields. It could be biomass from beer brewing, ethanol manufacturing, methanol manufacturing, where you take that biomass, convert it into energy, and then feed back into whatever that industrial process was, heat. Industry pays uh, about 50% of the energy cost for industry is spent on heating things. And so Bitcoin miners are great at generating heat hmm. when they mine Bitcoin. About 95% of the energy that goes into a chip that mines Bitcoin comes out as heat. So we believe that Bitcoin miners will be able to essentially take stranded energy in the form of methane, biomass, what have you, generate electricity, generate heat, sell the heat back into an industrial process. All of that subsidizes the cost to mine Bitcoin because Bitcoin is simply how we generate the heat that we sell back. And I think mm -hmm. longer term, Bitcoin mining will move from being these large data center sites with hundreds of megawatts to being hundreds of thousands of much smaller sites that are doing everything from heating buildings in Finland to mining, uh, to heating greenhouses, hmm. heating uh, shrimp farms, uh, industrial processes, ethanol plants, processing corn waste, cow manure, dairies, et cetera. That's the future for Bitcoin mining long term. Fred, we thank you so much for drawing out the future, the next couple of weeks, and frankly, the next couple of years ahead. That is Marathon Digital CEO Fred Thiel. Now, coming up, we're going to talk to Circle's global head of policy, pushing back on the idea that the crypto industry's role in illicit financing, just as the Senate holds a hearing today, just on the issue. And the chances of Terraform's Do Kwon heading to the U.S. to face fraud charges are rising after Montenegro's Supreme Court blocks his extradition to South Korea. And access all the latest data and news on crypto, check out CRYP Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. This is Bloomberg. We are increasingly concerned about the ways these actors are using cryptocurrencies to circumvent our sanctions. For example, years ago, Al-Qaeda and affiliated terrorist groups largely based out of Syria operated a Bitcoin money laundering network using social media platforms to solicit cryptocurrency donations. After receiving virtual currency, they laundered the proceeds through various online gift card exchanges to be able to purchase what they needed to advance their violent agenda. That was Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyemo at the Senate Banking Committee hearing on countering illicit financing and conflicts in Russia and Gaza, and it highlighted crypto's role in those efforts in particular. We're going to discuss what's going on with Circle Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Global Policy Dante Desparte. If you think about the testimony that was put forward uh, today in Congress, how do you think about the Biden administration's approach to financing through the crypto industry, particularly when it comes to stablecoins? 
Well, one of the things I think is a little bit candidly frustrating at this point in time is that the Biden administration was the administration that issued the first executive order on blockchain and digital assets calling for the broad whole of government study of the sector. But yet, notwithstanding that, and notwithstanding many calls from people like Secretary uh, Janet Yellen, Chairman Powell, and Deputy Secretary Adeyemo himself, on Congress to act to effectively equip the U.S. government and regulators and others with rules for the, sp for the space, we're still seeing this, this era of congressional inaction. And that's, that's an item that is, for us, very frustrating. As a company, Circle operates according to all of the rules that govern money transmission in the U.S. We, we of course, abide by all of the rules for anti-money laundering and countering the financing and terrorism and U.S. sanctions. But, but in a world where the U.S. doesn't get stablecoin legislation across the finish line, we think much of the industry will be defined by the worst actors in this space. Well, I'm wondering, in your opinion, how to stop those worst actors in this space. Just to repeat a little bit of what we heard from uh, Deputy Treasury Secretary Wally Adeyamo uh, just in the last uh, moments, um, he talked about North Korea and Russia among the state actors increasingly using digital assets. Uh, he talked about the Iran uh, Quds Force. Uh, sending crypto to militant groups, Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. What, in your opinion, is the best way to stop illicit actors from using crypto? Well, I think the first order of business, and I know your program uh, studies crypto very carefully, is to understand the nuances. The term of art crypto is a neutral term of art that is, frankly, no more um, uh, politically motivated than the Internet itself. What we really need to identify, especially when, com when combating illicit activity, are the bad actors or the bad products or the bad nexus of actors, um, government and non-government, that may take advantage of any financial system uh, for their illicit gains. And that's a really critical opportunity. I recently wrote an op-ed, in fact, anticipating the Deputy Secretary's uh, testimony today in Coindesk that underscored this point, that crypto itself doesn't have an illicit finance problem. Bad actors do. And bad actors will exploit any financial system to get away with it. And all of us in the industry and beyond have to work together in a model of collective defense. The deputy secretary has called on the Senate and Congress to give the Treasury new authorities. The industry has also done quite a lot in enforcing good standards across the sector. So while I can understand your point here that it's not just a, a, a concept of a bad product but bad actors, and you've also heard, of course, through the crypto industry, well, people have used cash for illicit reasons as well. And a lot of these actors have been found through the use of blockchain and being able to track what's going on. With all that said, Dante, I think that given everything that's happened with the significant fines you've seen coming out of the Treasury and significant uh, actions coming out of uh, the crypto industry that have been bad over the last couple of years, how does crypto kind of save itself from this reputation and, to Tim's question, distance itself further from those bad actors that you're talking about? Well, it's, it's a good point, and obviously I'm one to avoid false equivalencies in, in you know, comparing all of crypto, for example, to all of cash. But I do think it's a really critical opportunity to underscore where there are good actors using new technologies, blockchains, digital assets, and cryptography, to say the least. Mm. Um, we could demonstrate not only better performance than peer institutions, we could, we could even get to a state with illicit activity of what I would like to describe as effective deterrence. For example, in a recent um, TRM Labs report looking at illicit finance and illicit finance economy in the space, their reporting has identified that USDC, Circle Stablecoin, right. is used um, almost rarely, 99.995% of the time, USDC is used for illicit purposes. Um, and that is, in, my, in our view, a function of the fact that Circle has structured itself to be compliant with all of the rules and norms uh, that responsible actors anywhere in the financial system must abide by. The gap that right. the United States has is in not promulgating those standards around the world. We're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Circle Chief Strategy Officer, Head of Global Policy, Dante Desparte, joining us from Paris. Coming up, the U.S. closer to getting extradition approval for Montenegro after finding Doquan and Terraform Labs liable for fraud. This is Bloomberg.
Well, Montenegro's Supreme Court overturning earlier decisions to extradite Terraform Labs co-founder Do Kwon to South Korea, boosting U.S. efforts to try the former crypto mogul for fraud charges. Bloomberg's Ava Benny Morrison joins us now. Ava, good to have you with us. Um, what does this mean for Do Kwon? Do Kwon has been stuck in this tug of war over his extradition in Montenegro for the past 12 months. So it means that he is more than likely going to head back to New York where he'll be on trial for fraud charges. Prosecutors here allege that he misled investors over the um, over his company, Terraform Labs, um, before it collapsed and wiped out almost $40 billion in investor assets in 2022. How do you see this all playing out given the issues with extradition? How does it complicate the timelines and the ability for the U.S. to do their part of the job here? One of the unusual parts of this case is Doquan has actually consented to extradition. He hasn't consented to where he will go because that decision is not really up to him. So once the court makes a decision on where he will go or if the justice minister can make a decision on which country he goes to, we'll expect to see him back here in, on U.S. soil more than likely pretty soon. OK, so when he is here on U.S. soil, is it a, a trial, the likes of what we saw with Sam Bankman fried Is that the sort of thing we're talking about here? It could be. This um, Doquan is a big figure in the crypto industry and this would be a really big case. If he chooses not to plead guilt, not to plead guilty, he will go to trial, and we could see something um, on a similar level to Sam Bankman Fried's trial. What do we know about anybody else that was involved with Terraform Labs at this point? Uh, he's a Terraform. The former Terraform Labs CFO was also arrested with Do Kwon in Montenegro. He's already been arrested, uh, sorry, extradited back to South Korea, where he's facing accusations there. Uh, there were a few other people who were associated with the company that were also um, arrested and indicted in South Korea as well. Uh, Ava, just very briefly, what's the next thing we're watching for? What could happen with Do Kwon? We're waiting for the Supreme Court there in Montenegro to make, to make yet another decision on where he will go and when he will be extradited, um, hopefully this week. Bloomberg's Ava Boning, Betty Morrison, we thank you so much. Following all the trials, my goodness, and it has been a firestorm of them, for goodness sake. Uh, that does it for Bloomberg Crypto today. Join us again at the same time, same place next week, Tim. Same Tim, also. <laughs> same same Tim. Tim. Same place next week. Well, stick week. with us. More markets up ahead next. This is Bloomberg.